evening services. And one of the high points of our, of our series, these five Sundays that we have had this series in place, has been the uh, Sunday evening gathering where we get he come here and, and uh, uh, view a video, a short video, about five minutes. Then we move to our various connect groups and spend the time really talking about what we hear on Sunday morning. And it, uh, after last week, I was really interested in finding out what would be said. And uh, it was very good and very uh, encouraging to hear our folks talking about actually giving everything they had with them. And many, many folks did so. Actually, if you weren't here Wednesday night, you probably don't know, uh, over $4,000 was placed in the uh, treasure chest last Sunday morning, and we're in the process of logistically working out where this money will go to meet needs. And we will give you a list of those things and let you know exactly what you did last week in serving the church family. So many times our focus is overseas, it's the church that we're starting down the street or in other places, and we fail to focus on our home group. And we need to be sure that we minister to our folks and that we do so in the proper way. Now, the question that I have, I've done so many series over the years, and the question that I have is what will we take away from this series? That's the question now. Hopefully, it will be that life in community, life connected to other believers in his kingdom is life as it's meant to be giving us a new identity and a new set of values and ethics to live by, that we are actually mirroring God's perfect will as we are connected together and others see us living in community with each other. It's life without barriers. That was one of the first things that we discovered, that the first thing that is needed is to move those barriers that are intended to keep people at arm's length, move them out of the way, and to become approachable. And many of us need to work on those things. That's give us something to work on. That's a big uh, project. It's life characterized by love, primarily. And I noticed the, the uh, video presentation up here of the I Love My Church. Love is the primary uh, ingredient in living together as God wants us to. Community is another. Giving is another. Serving the body of Christ. This past Wednesday evening, I was uh, dealing with uh, the Gospel of Matthew, or uh, Acts, and it was the, the third missionary journey of Paul. And to me, I, as I studied that, because it covered several chapters, and I'm not trying to go every verse. And so uh, as Paul was on this journey, I began to think about the journey that we're on. We're on a journey. And this, this is not our destination. This is not where we, this is not the terminal point here. But God has prepared a place for us. And we look forward to that. Amen? What we do now will greatly impact our life then. Think about that. I used to know a friend, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he was an evangelist and he preached the message all over the country, living life now in light of eternity. And what we do now, that's what Paul was doing. He said, if I can just finish my course finish the work God has given me to do, then I can stand before God. And that's speaking to the church family. It's good to have a forum where you can speak to church family. And I, I like to see every person that isn't involved in ministry to come and be present in those places because you miss a lot of ministry and a lot of what God is saying to us. 
God has displayed to the world his kind of life through Jesus and the church. We are now his representatives. And uh, he is displaying and demonstrating kingdom life through the church. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How do people hear and discover How do they experience the kingdom of God? How do they come to that point? My text is found this morning in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 through 16, and I believe it will answer the question that I posed to you this morning. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall it How how shall its saltedness be restored? And someone has said, probably can't be. I want to say something to you. I want you to listen to me carefully. There is a point of backsliding in which you cannot return. There is a point of no return. You can go away from God for so long And harden your heart so hard that you cannot hear God. And that you cannot be brought back. And the the scripture talks about this in various places. And so we need to be careful. If you're away from God this morning, you're on that path. I'm not saying that everybody that goes away from God goes that far. But you have the potential. I do know this, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And God is saying to us, don't mess with it. Don't mess with that. Maintain your saltiness. Don't get in a rut. You know what a rut is. It's a grave with both ends knocked out. And a lot of believers today are in a spiritual rut. God wants us to grow until he calls us home. And there's more for us to know and to receive. And we'll never ever fathom the depth of God's provision for us. It's greater than anything we can ever know. And so the Lord admonishes us, don't lose your saltiness. Maintain that saltiness in your spiritual life because you're the salt of the earth. And if it does lose its saltiness, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How does that happen? Well, that's what my subject is today. How to be salt and light. God says you are. Now become what he says you are. And live it out on a day-to-day basis. You see, God gives us the privilege of having a part in making the kingdom experience available to all as we are who we should be and do what God has enabled us to do. The first step is God enables his followers to become salt and light in the world. He's already said you are. You should mark that. This is who we are this morning. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. Salt preserves, among other things. I have a friend who has a number of stents in his heart. I don't know why he does it. But every time I eat with him, the first thing he said, where's the salt? 
and he will shake that salt over every piece of, of food in his plate. And I'm watching him and I'm thinking, if I had the problems you had, I'd leave that off. I'd just kind of cut that back a little bit. But cause too much saltiness can hurt us. But did you know that you cannot heal without salt in your body? That salt is indispensable. Your heart will not function without a measure of salt in your body. Salt is very valuable. And I, I have read, I don't have those figures this morning, but how many hundreds of thousands of tons of salts humans consume every year. Salt is important. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Light dispels darkness. And we are light. And this morning, we, we need to realize how that happens. It's when you and I become what God says we are. How do you do that? Well, you back up to verse number 2 in this chapter, and God begins to enumerate some characteristics of the character of those who are salt and light. First of all, they're poor in spirit. And blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. And so we become poor in spirit. It means this. We realize in our heart of hearts how desperately we need God. That's poor in spirit in the deepest level of our consciences, we realize our entire need of God. Have you ever come before God and said, Lord, if, if I didn't have you, I couldn't do nothing. I'm nothing without you. I cannot make it without you. And yet many times we depend on our talents, our plans, our programs, when in reality God makes the world tick. And our world will not make it without God. And so I need God. And recognizing that need of God, it is so important. It's a self-emptying conviction that before God, we are void of everything. And it lies at the foundation of all spiritual work. It's plainly a frame of mind it, I don't have time this morning to go to the Old Testament, but I could and show you how that often when God talks about the poor, he's not talking about how much money they have. He's talking about their, their poor in spirit, poor spiritually, destitute of God, not in relationship with God, or turned away from God, which his people seem to be able to do. And so it's a frame of mind, poor in spirit. The poor in spirit is rich, enriched with the fullness of Christ. That's what the kingdom is. It's Jesus in our life with all of his victories, all of his possessions, all that he has at our disposal when Christ is in us. And that's a wonderful place to be. The fullness of blessing will come. We get a measure now, but the fullness will come when he says, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. We will then enter into the perfection that God speaks about in, this, in these verses. The poor in spirit, in the Phillips translation, it says, How happy are the humble-minded, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And the reason that he uses the word happy is because it's an internal thing that he's talking about, not external. Secondly, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The sense of spiritual poverty complements this Beatitude. Because uh, the scripture, it, when we realize how destitute we are, 
cut off from God. It's more important to us than our breath. I had a, I had a, uh, a pastor friend, and I, I'm going to tell you what he said. He was having an all-night prayer meeting, and he was praying, and God spoke to him and said, this is the rapture out of your church. These are the people that would be ready to go. That man had a heart attack, and he was, it looked like he would be disabled, but God raised him up, and here's what the Lord, he said, here's what God said. I can make you live without a heart. But God restored his heart and he spent the next 15 years going back and forth to Russia and sharing the gospel once that door was open. I'm telling you that God is the answer to whatever your question is. God is the answer to whatever you're seeking this morning. All of that and no hangover. Isn't it wonderful? We recognize our poverty. We mourn. Here's what Isaiah said. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Have you ever said that? Have you ever realized and said, God, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I need you so much. I'm desperate for you. You see, woe is me, for I am undone. Poverty of spirit says I'm undone, not that I've attained. I like to liken this to a cake that's only cooked on one side. Have you ever had that experience? I've never cooked a cake in my life, but I've seen one or two that was only done on one side. The top side was good, the other side wasn't. And when you try to flip that thing out and begin to deal with it, it's a little runny and soupy. It's just not there. But our lives, are you undone this morning? Well, let me tell you, you may not be, but I am. I'm not finished. He's not finished with me. I haven't arrived. He has a, I'm a work in progress. And I'm saying, Lord, how would you put up with me and deal with me as you do? Because I make so many mistakes. I miss it so often. Poverty says I'm undone. Mourning breaks out in a lamentation. I'm undone. I'm undone. Woe is me. There's a class of mourners in the scripture. And again, I don't have time to to do much with it. But in, in Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah speaks about these mourners. Mourners in Zion. Mourners in Zion. He, you know that verse, those verses, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, I like King James better. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. I'm telling you that mourning, God recognized the mourners. This is not talking about somebody that has gone through a catastrophe, had a divorce, or had some other unthinkable thing happen. But it's someone that's recognized how short they come in the presence of Almighty God. And they cry out. And God says, yes, I can do something with you. You're seeking the right thing. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Even now they get beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Sowing in tears. 
They reap even here in joy. And some of you are sowing, you're sowing in people that are so important to you. Listen, let's, let's move ahead, fast forward a moment. Think about when the harvest comes in and you see those people coming to know Christ in a real way. What joy there will be because you have mourned and wept and sowed the seed. In this life, we, we rejoice over them. We, we see them coming. Coming to the kingdom of God. Sowing in tears, even here, reaping in joy. Still, all present comfort, even the best, is partial, interrupted, short-lived. The days of our mourning shall soon be ended. And then God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. And in the fullest sense of the word, the mourners will be comforted. I look forward to that day, don't you? I know what it is to see a mother discover a child is pregnant out of wedlock. And one mother said, something died in me that morning. My life has never been the same since. But I've got news for you. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When Christ returns, joy will reign among the people of God. If we prepared for it. I believe the tears in heaven are partially from those who recognize wasted years on this earth. Where they've let the just making a living get in the way. They've let other things hinder God's work in their life. And they're going to realize I didn't never attain, I never attained to the fullness of God's plan for my life. And they're going to weep, but God's going to wipe those tears away. And comfort will come. Meekness, the opposite of high-mindedness. The scripture admonishes us to, to find men of low estate. When I was on staff in Lakeland first, my, I used to notice my pastor. When there was a holiday weekend, he, he had a boat. And many times they would go down to Winter Haven and and uh, there were some gardens there. They've closed them now, and I forget the name of them. Winter Haven Garden or something, and they had boat uh, shows and all this stuff, and he was there with them. And what he would do, he would take the most unlikely family in the church, uneducated, ignorant, couldn't murder the king's English, didn't dress like everybody else. Those were the ones he invited because the Bible says, condescend to men a low estate. I've known a few people in my day, they seek out those who are wealthy and successful and they want to butter up to them. I love them too, but I love these too. And I know what God says. Don't be high-minded. Humble yourself. You see, when the world begins to see those kinds of things going on in our life, that's salt and light. Not a quarrelsome and revengeful spirit. It rather takes wrongs, suffers itself to be defrauded. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Doesn't avenge itself, but rather gives place to wrath. Romans 12, 19. Like the meek one. When reviled, he reviles not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 1 Peter 2, 19 to 22. And it says the meek shall inherit the earth. And the word earth here could be land. And one Bible scholar says it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a comment that refers to the land God's promise to Israel. And when they were in favor with God, they inherited their promised land. But when they lost that favor, God allowed them to be taken captive and they would be gone 70 years. One generation, 40 years in the wilderness. Why would God send his best preachers 
to people who will not treat them properly. I'm telling you, he doesn't. Because God loves too much. And sometimes he gives us our desires. And that's the worst judgment God could ever do, leave us to our own ways. And here we find God, here we find the Lord condescending to us, reaching down low and talking about the land. And what it means is the favor of the Lord. I've read it someplace and I believe it with all my heart. A moment of favor is worth more than a life of labor. You can work your bones to the, your fingers to the bone, but if you have the favor of the Lord, you've got everything. He favors you. He approves you. That's the main thing in life is to have that favor. I want God's favor. I want to know that, I, that he's pleased. When they delight themselves in the Lord, he gives them the desires of their heart. When they commit their way to him, he brings it to pass, bringing forth their righteousness as the light and their judgment as the noonday. The little that they have, even when de <clears throat> deprived of their rights, is better than the riches of many wicked. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Things do not make us happy. Adorned with imperishable beauty, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. What is imperishable beauty? A meek and a quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. What does that mean? It means God highly values this. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? The deepest cravings are after spiritual blessing. We hunger after him. Did you know the keenest appetites that we have are hunger and thirst? And our Lord, by employing this figure, surely means those whose deepest cravings are after spiritual blessings. Listen to what jo Jacob said on his deathbed. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Here's what David said. My soul, he said, breaks for the longing that it has unto thy judgments at all times. Those who seek God, those who cry out to him, those are the ones that have the favor of God. They shall be filled. They shall be filled, saturated, satiated. It means so full you're running over with what you are seeking for. And then there's mercy. Trench, who is a theologian, said, according to the view given in Scripture, the Christian stands in a middle point between a mercy received and a mercy yet needed. We've re has God been merciful to me? Oh, my Lord. But as I stand here today, I know I'm going to need it before the day's out. And I, just recently, the scripture became very meaningful to me. Thy mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness to me, O Lord. You may be sitting here this morning saying or listening by over the internet or in TV and you may be thinking my sins are so great. Not so. Not so. His mercies are new every morning. God is so merciful they're higher than the heavens. And then there's the pure heart. When we, are, we think about God's mercy, that's what enables us to show mercy. We look back on what he's done for us. And we know that's the motivation for mercy on our part. 
and we look forward to the mercy which we yet need. And we're assured God's mercy will be there. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In Jesus' day, almost exclusively, cleanliness was external. Ceremonial purification and external morality. You see, I grew up in this kind of an atmosphere where holiness was the length of your dress and how high it come up. Now, some people could lift them a little bit. It would help us all. But that's not holiness. If it's down to here and you couldn't see their arms and they're down to the floor and they had their hair in a PhD, a Pentecostal hairdo. They were holy. Well, I've known some of those people that you couldn't get their tongue on an altar. It was, the altar was too short. They could gossip from Monday to Sunday. And they'd come in with their, quote, external forms of holiness showing. And everybody thought, man, they are, they are it. But God sees it different because righteousness and purity of heart. Can a leopard cleanse his spots? No. But my God can sprinkle your heart from an evil conscience. He can purge your conscience of dead works. And he can purify you. And when you have a sprinkled conscience and purged conscience, light has emerged inside. You begin to see him. His figure, his face, his being becomes more clear to you than it's ever been. And your life is transformed further. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. And the peacemaker, those who are people of peace and making peace, they receive peace and they give it away. They give it to others. They shall be called children of God. When the Bible says sons of God or children of God, it means that we bear the nature of our Father. And our God is a peacemaker. And he comes and gives peace when they, they are, called, are called children of God. This reconciliation actually takes place and one has peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the peace of God which passes all understanding. The peace receiver becomes transformed into a peace diffuser. Listen, listen to me and you think about this. Hurt people hurt others. Hurt people who are not healed will hurt others. But when you and I get healed, we become a healing agent. And we can share, yes, this is how I used to be. But God has changed my life. And so God is seen, reflected in them. And by family likeness, these peacemakers are recognized as the children of God. You see, salt and light result in these characteristic traits in our, in our character. Seven is the number of perfection. Perfection of character. Sevenfold blessing refers to the perfection of blessing. There is a present fulfillment. There's a future fulfillment. Right now, his transforming power produces a marvelous change in our life. The perfection will only be realized when he says, Come, you blessed of God. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you. These are characteristics of Jesus' disciples that allow God to establish his kingdom in his way through them. This is the kingdom like. God puts in us and then we demonstrate to the world by our actions the character profile of a person 
who can truly say, I love my church. This is his character profile. Your salt to preserve from corruption, to season, to freshen, to sweeten. In Scripture, mankind under unrestrained working of, his, of their own evil nature are represented as entirely corrupt. Listen to this. Before the flood, Genesis 6, 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and God saw the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. All flesh. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. Having no fear of God. Destruction and misery were in their way. After the flood, Genesis 8, 21, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of Noah's sacrifice, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is continually evil, evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creatures I've done. In the days of David, Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, the Lord looked down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any who understood who seek after God. He said they've all turned aside, all together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not even one. That's God's view. What does he see when he looks on us? A former Christian nation. We cannot be in his favor and do what we're doing. There's no way. And God will judge us if it hasn't already started. In Isaiah 1, 5 and 6, Isaiah says, why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? Listen to me, young person. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. God hates it with a passion. It's a hated sin. Rebellion, mom and dad, you're a little old, aren't you, to be going through your rebellious state. In the time that we settle the issue, and we learn to live together in harmony and peace and reflect to this community what it means to be in the family of God. I say yes. Yes. Why will you, why will you continue to rebel? Here's what Isaiah said. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and, and sores and raw wounds. They are, now, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. In other words, what he is saying there, from the lowest of people to the highest echelons. Can you believe anybody today? Corporations are corrupt. Government is corrupt. I had a Christian tell me, he said, listen, you shouldn't pay tithes. You're in college. God understands. Not so. Not so. And those who cheat on their taxes, God help us be true blue. Real. Here's what Paul said. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and by, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
he joins himself in there. When I was talking about mourning and lamenting, I thought about Paul. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be unto God, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's up to the undertaking. He's able to do it. You see, seasoning and shining is not just about the words you speak, but about the life we live. The message of our life. Have you ever heard the statement, I can't hear what you're saying, your actions are louder than your words. And actions speak loud. Though we're not confining ourselves to just actions, yet our actions must back up our message. And when we become salt and we become light, God is backing up who we are in his sight. You can't separate message from lifestyle. It's about who we are and how we are. The values that we live by. Those values bring fl flavor to a bland, rotting world. When I saw the picture of that young lady, who they say was intoxicated, who ran into the celebration in Oklahoma, and now four people are dead, her life is ruined. I don't know if she was intoxicated, that's what it said. One witness said people were flying everywhere. You see, when I was a little boy, my sister was hit by a car. I saw it. I saw her sailing through the air and coming around like this. And when the car stopped, the tire was lean, was a, her head was against the tire. Thank God it didn't kill her. I have told her a time or two, I think it knocked some of your sense out. Thank God she knows Jesus now, but after a lot of pain. I've listened to her pain. I've wept as I listen. Sitting on the kitchen table with a shotgun across her lap, scared spitless, rats running on the floor. I've seen broken lives. I know what it does to parents. If you can sleep, young man, in this service, you can sleep on your way to the wrong place. If you're not moved today, what will it take? And when will you move? It is so serious. It is so serious. I guess that's why I shudder to think about hitting somebody. I remember the thud. I couldn't have been more than six years old. I watched my mom screaming, running to see if she was alive. Thank God. It broke her up, but she recovered. She's still living today. She's my older sister. God is saying to us, friends, I forgive. My mercy is yours. And this morning, before we begin to serve communion, receive our offering, I want to give an altar call. If you're not where you need to be with the Lord, I plead with you this morning, unashamedly, without any embarrassment, it's later than you think. Your opportunities will not be forever. You don't know what's around the corner. Why take the chance? Why not make it certain? Peter said, make your calling election and sure. I read through that list of things. I want to go back and study that in 2 Peter. If you have these things in your life, you'll not be nearsighted. You know what nearsighted spiritually is? The only thing you can see is the world. You can't see spiritual things because you're blinded to them. But if these things are in your life and abound, 
you will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. It's all about his mercy. It's all about his mercy. God is merciful, and that mercy is still there, still available for whosoever will, may come and drink of the water of life freely. That's the invitation the Bible ends with. If any man thirst, let him come. If you want God this morning, you can have God. You can come and experience him at your deepest level. God loves you today. He loves you. He'll be honest with you. He'll help you. He's helped me. I still grow it. I haven't arrived. I'm just on the journey. Today, if you're not where you should be with God, you need to get right with God. And I want to pray with you. If you've never received Christ as Savior and Lord and you're ready today, you're saying, Pastor, I want Jesus in my heart. I want you to pray for me. You're in the right place today. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Sometimes it makes it a little easier for folks. And I, I don't want to make it too easy, but I want to make it easy enough that you are willing to move forward and say, yes, yes, I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord this morning. And I want Jesus into my life. While every head bowed, every Christian, would you pray with me? Pray for your neighbor. If you don't know they're saved or if there's someone that you wonder about, pray for them. Pray for them. Maybe a family member that's not even present. Commit yourself to prayer and to seeking God until you see them come in. Sow in tears. Weep in joy. Sow in tears. I think of a mother's tears who has witness with her child and her child has scorned the witness and touched the deepest, deepest pain of a mother's heart because if you're anything like my mother, if I know my mother's God, my mother is very pleased. If I don't, she's very concerned about me. This morning, Pastor, I'm not where I should be with God. Today, Today, I am turning around, burning my bridges behind me so I cannot go back, and I am moving forward on this journey with God. Would you slip your hand up right now? Just put it up and down. Put it up and down quickly. I need God this morning. I need the Lord this morning. Anybody in this room? Not care what anybody thinks. Pastor, that's me. I've tried in my own strength. I've failed. But I'm coming God's way today. I want God to work in me and make me what I need to be. It's the only way that it can happen. Would you slip it high? Slip it high. If you see a, you point it out to me, guys, if you see someone raising their hand. I need the Lord today. You see, I am absolutely certain that this message that God has laid on my heart is not, is not the wrong message. It is the right message. And for someone in this room, God is speaking to you again, again, because he's spoken to you many times. You haven't heeded his voice, but today, God is reaching out to you one more time in mercy in kindness pastor remember me I will not embarrass you but I will pray for you right now if you'll slip it high slip your hand up right now would you do it in Jesus name pastor I want God in my life today I'm ready God bless you sir yes just put it up and down okay anybody else I need Jesus in my life today I want you to pray for me today. Anyone else? Would you slip it high? Anybody else in this room? Father, it's amazing how hard that we can become, even at a young age. 
In my tenure here, I've seen kids that we never moved, never reached. They were hard. Harder than I've seen some men who have been in deep sin for much of their lives. This morning, I'm praying that you will open hearts and open lives and help us to see where we stand, what we need and where you're working in us, that we can cooperate with what you're doing. I pray for those who've slipped their hand up. I ask you right now in Jesus' name that you would touch this heart and life. Make yourself known to them, I pray. Put your hand upon them in Jesus' name. I bless you for it in the name of the Lord. Amen. I want to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. And everyone else, reaffirm your faith in God. I want you to pray. At the end of the service, I'm going to invite you to come forward. But let's ask God. We're going to take communion. And you repent. Ask God to forgive you. Come into your life. Save me. Lord, I want you in my life. I'm sorry for my sins. Please come into my heart right now and you partake of, partake of communion with us, and then I want you to just step out in affirmation of your commitment a few minutes later in this service. There's something about taking an open stand. It's important, and I'm urging you to do that. Now, Lord, I'm asking you right now for my friends, in Jesus' name, that they will pray this prayer and make it theirs and be sincere about it in Jesus' name. Everybody pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I need you, God. I am undone. I haven't arrived. I want you to keep working in my life. I want you to help me to move forward. May those around me see the difference in my life. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me. I turn it over to you. I give you management of my life. I surrender to you. I sell out to you now. I've made a mess. I want you to take it and do it right. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins, for coming into my heart, Thank you for saving me.